Hi students. So what I'm going to do for you here is I'm going to provide a, a video lecture on the presidency of John Adams. The reason I'm going to do this is because um, the John Adams presidency is a little bit of a, there are some difficult topics in here to understand. And especially with your test coming up, if you need like a, a, a refresher on the John Adams presidency, one of the things you can do is just rewatch this video. So that my hope is that this helps you, right? So let's start with number one, okay? It says the presidential election of 1796 and John Adams. So I have under here, it says the first contested presidential election. So what I mean by that is, is that after serving two terms in office, George Washington uh, steps down as president. And everybody knew that George Washington was going to be the first president, but nobody, it wasn't clear uh, who was going to be the second president. Um, now, in the modern day, it's pretty much assumed that, you know, if you serve as vice president, that you're working your way up. Uh, but that was not the way that uh, things were viewed in U.S. politics in, in the early years. It was not necessarily assumed that a vice president would be the next president. So the two main contenders that you have is you have John Adams, the vice president under George Washington, and you have the former secretary of state, Thomas Jefferson who was George Washington's Secretary of State, but resigned after Washington did a few things that, that uh, Jefferson did not like. So down here it says first place, second place system. The original presidential uh, like electoral system in the United States said that if you got the most electoral votes, you would become president. If you got the second most electoral votes, you would be named as vice president. So what happens in this election is that J John Adams gets the most pre you know, electoral votes and Thomas Jefferson receives the second most electoral votes. So this creates a problem because John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are not aligned politically. So one of John Adams' problems right off the bat is that his vice president wants him to fail. Uh, so that wasn't very good. So let's go down here where it says John Adams's qualifications. Um, you know, John Adams did quite a bit to really establish himself as one of the most prominent Americans. Uh, I mean, where do I start? You know, he he's he's really important in the lead up to the American Revolution. He serves in the Second Continental Congress. He helps write the, the dec he helps write and edit the Declaration of Independence. Um, he he goes to Europe. As a diplomat, he helps negotiate the Treaty of Paris to end the war. Uh, he serves as the first vice president of the United States. So, I mean, when you look at John Adams's personal characteristics, uh, and, and I guess I guess shouldn't say personal characteristics, but qualifications, the guy is more than qualified to be president. But down here, it says John Adams's personal shortcomings where George Washington was this majestic figure, this guy that had everybody's respect. Uh, we can't say the same about John Adams. Uh, physically, John Adams was kind of short, kind of heavy set. Um, John Adams was very elitist. He thought he was better than everybody. John Adams had a habit of kind of being uh, very short tempered. He was, he, he would be quick to snap on people and yell at people. So I guess you could make the argument that even though John Adams was really qualified based on what he did earlier in his life, he didn't really have the personality to be president. He didn't have an executive personality. All right. And what we see is that John Adams as the second president, he makes some political mistakes. Um, number one, at this time that John Adams is being elected president, it's fairly obvious that there are two developing political parties in the United States. There's a group called the Federalists that are led by Alexander Hamilton, and there are a group called the Democratic Republicans led by Thomas Jefferson. Now, one thing you notice here is that neither party was led by John Adams. John Adams was a Federalist. On paper, he was allied with George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. But the truth was, was that I guess you could say John Adams was very independent minded. He didn't really align himself with either political party. He kind of said, I just want to make decisions for myself. And that really came back to, to bite John Adams. 
So during the course of Adams' presidency, not only is he fighting against Thomas Jefferson and, and his Republicans, he's fighting against his own party because pretty much everybody in that Federalist Party was loyal to Alexander Hamilton and not loyal to the president, John Adams. Another thing politically that I want to bring your attention to is that John Adams kept the same cabinet that George Washington had. So after uh, Alexander Hamilton resigns and after Thomas Jefferson resigns, George Washington has, has to appoint new people to be in his cabinet. And these guys aren't really well known. Uh, you know, their names, I'll tell you, Oliver Walcott, uh, James McHenry, you know, these are not guys that, you know, you, you would know off the tip of your tongue. But basically, George Washington has to appoint new leaders, um, you know, after the original cabinet uh, steps down. Another guy's name was Timothy Pickering, right? These are not names that you have to know or study. The point is this, is that when John Adams takes over, he doesn't know if it's proper to get rid of the guys in George Washington's cabinet and replace them with his own choices. Because remember, he's second president. He doesn't really know what to do. So he keeps George Washington's cabinet. And all of those men, Timothy Pickering, Oliver Walcott, James McHenry, they were all loyal to Alexander Hamilton, not loyal to John Adams. So that creates a lot of political problems for Adams. And then lastly here, we're going we're gonna to focus on the point that John Adams had really large shoes to fill. I mean, who could follow George Washington? Who could follow the greatest hero in United States history? I mean, really, the answer is no one. And John Adams just did not have the, the gravitas to follow somebody like George Washington. All right, now let's move to our next section here. Problems with France. I'm going to read this word for word basically because, uh, you know, John Adams' presidency was pretty much defined by problems with France. So what, what's the background? What do we need to know? It says the U.S. and France formed a military alliance during America's war for independence. That's something that you should all know. France assumed that a partnership between the United States and France would continue after the war was over. So France thinks, you know, United States, you, we, we helped you win your war. Now you are an independent country. Now the, the two nations, France and the United States, are going to be friends moving forward. It doesn't exactly work out that way. During the presidency of George Washington, in 1793, George Washington issues what's called a Proclamation of Neutrality. So Britain and France went to war against each other, and George Washington says we are choosing neither side. Uh, France thought we should have chose their side. And then, to make things even worse, in 1794, the United States signs a commercial treaty, like a business treaty, with Britain. And that was called the Jay Treaty. Uh, and France interpreted that as us siding with Britain over France. So between neutrality and the Jay Treaty, France now wants to get revenge against the United States. So what do they do? The French Navy began seizing and capturing United States merchant ships. So American ships that were at, like out in the ocean and traveling, the French Navy was stopping them capturing them and taking all the stuff that were on them. And in the span of a few years, over 300 U.S. ships were captured uh, and the goods were seized off them. And then because the French were capturing all of our ships, um, it was causing economic problems because the, the amount of cost to ship goods across the ocean really went up. So what we did, or what John Adams did, was he sent three American diplomats all right, like uh, negotiators, to France to basically arrange some kind of peace, find a way to stop France from attacking our boats. But instead of us finding a, a solution, what we see is that more problems are caused. So here is one of the big events of the John Adams presidency. It's referred to as the XYZ affair. So let's read through this. It says, American diplomats were sent to France and they were bribed, okay? That means that they were basically told that 
they would have to pay money to do something as a threat. The American diplomats were told that they had to pay money to French government officials if they wanted to get to the table to negotiate for peace. So they said, we're told, if you want peace and you want to get to the negotiations, you have to give us money first. That's a bribe. The American diplomats refused and news of the event was published in American newspapers. So the American public reaction is that Americans viewed the French and the, and the bribe as an insult that was a, that damaged American pride. And in the newspapers, they referred to this bribe or this event as the XYZ affair because they wanted to keep the identities of the French people involved secret. So they codenamed them X, Y, and Z. So at this time, there were calls for war against France. And at, at this time, the Federalist Party, the party of Hamilton and supposedly John Adams, they were the ones who really wanted to go to war against France. Okay. So here is where Adams gets himself in trouble. Adams refused to go to war against the French. He said that our military is non-existent. We don't really have an army. We don't really have a Navy. So we were not ready to go to war. Now, Hamilton, he really wanted to go to war. Hamilton wants a national army created and Hamilton wants to be named the head general of the American army. So John Adams says, nope, we're not forming an army, and Hamilton, I'm not putting you in charge. So at this point, Hamilton and Adams have a huge falling out, and for the rest of Adams' presidency, ha uh, Hamilton does everything he can to make sure that John Adams fails. So even though Alexander Hamilton is often portrayed like in the musical as like this genius figure, this great guy, we really see the ugly side of Alexander Hamilton when John Adams is president. Okay. Now let's keep going. The second major event of the John Adams presidency is an event called the quasi war. Quasi means like semi, sort of, kind of, halfway, something like that. So after the XYZ affair, for two years, there was an undeclared naval war, which means it wasn't declared, it wasn't official, it was kind of an unofficial naval war between the United States and France in the Caribbean Sea. So for two years, every time that a U.S. ship and a French ship saw each other, they fired on each other, and there were these like ship, ship versus ship battles. So the significance of the quasi-war was that this conflict caused America to really focus on building up their navy. Let's build ships. Let's put somebody in the cabinet called the Secretary of the Navy, stuff like that. Now, the last and most significant uh, event of the Adams's pre Adams presidency were a series of laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts. If there is one event that you know very well, this is the most testable material of the John Adams presidency. Know the Alien and Sedition Acts inside and out. So let's go through them. First, it says during the issues between the United States and France, Americans began to fear foreigners, immigrants, foreigners, anybody who was not born in America because it was viewed as foreigners being a threat. So why? The fear was that especially French immigrants, because we were having problems with France, French immigrants would move to America they would infiltrate the U.S. government so they'd get elected or they'd, they'd, they'd get a high ranking position in our government. And once they infiltrated our government, they would do everything they could to cause our country to fail, collapse, etc. So what we did was Federalists in the Congress created a series of laws aimed at um, preventing this from happening. So there are there were a number of laws in these Alien and Sedition Acts. I'm only going to focus on two. The first law was called the Sedition Act, and it made it illegal to criticize the government or any of, gover uh, any of the government officials, like the president or the Congress. And then the second part, one I want you to focus on, is that if you were a suspicious foreign person, you could be deported or thrown out of the country. So... John Adams was pressured to sign these laws. 
sign these laws and do the right thing because foreign people are a threat. John Adams should have never signed these laws, but he does. Uh, but like, you know, I would argue that the Sedition Act, making it illegal to criticize the government, that violated the First Amendment to the Constitution. And as a result, because John Adams ends up supporting these laws, these laws were the worst aspect of his presidency. And they were the main reason why he was not elected to a second term. Now, let's wrap things up here. Okay. So we know John Adams's worst aspect of his presidency. He should have never signed the Alien and Sedition Acts. But did John Adams ever officially go to war against France? And that answer is no. And that is the best aspect of John Adams's presidency. So in 1800, there was a treaty signed establishing peace between the United States and France. So the two nations never fought a war against each other, an official war. The Treaty of Mort Fontaine solved all the lingering issues between the United States and France after America's independence. So if we're going to give Adams credit, he was able to avoid a war and he was able to fix the U.S.-French relationship. But in the process, he lost all political support. Uh, Hamilton hated him. The Federalist Party hated him. And when John Adams ran for re-election as president in the year 1800, he was defeated by Thomas Jefferson. So John Adams goes uh, down in history as America's first one-term president. Um, and historians do not really view Adams as a successful president. But you could argue that the fact that he resisted the urge to, to go to war against France, even though his entire party was telling him to, was a positive, but you cannot ignore the fact that he took away people, Americans first amendment rights to criticize the government. Uh, and that's the main thing that historians bash him on. All right, guys, I hope this was helpful. Uh, I'll see you soon.